Thank you, Mark, uh, and thank you for organising the meeting and for giving um, this chance to speak. Um, actually, Mark, you're my internal PhD examiner, so somebody else is going to walk in. So I should remember what you did in this <laughs> so, um, This is work actually we started with Richard in my first postdoc here many years ago, but we continue on um, doing this ever since. And I want to talk a bit about what happens as um, liquid solid impacts um, take place, and in particular the effects of. Um, gas cushioning. So the novelty here is going to be in what happened in the sort of post-impact phase of, of the impact. We've done quite a lot on pre-impact previously, but I want to spend a bit of time today um, talking about uh, post-impact. Um, so there are some experimental uh, photographs, they're not mine, but um, I picked them some fairly old ones now. But what you see when, when a, uh, a droplet hits a surface, you'll see an entrain bubble underneath the droplet, and there are various stages of the process here. You can see uh, bubble trapped in the middle here, and then at various stages of the, the ring, the disc contracting to form a bubble under um, the centre of the droplet. So, so the starting point of modelling this was work done by Frank 21 years ago now, um, a JFM paper here, which is the sort of basic formulation we're going to build on and um, talk a bit about today. As I go on, if you have any questions, obviously please just interrupt me as I go on, um, but um, any, any questions and any comments, and just, just yell. Right, so actually a couple of talks about this, this kind of topic already um, this week, but I'd like to start, because not everybody has seen this um, before, um, there were various scaling laws in previous talks the last couple of weeks, you've seen, seen things like x squared, squared, oh, sorry, um, r times Stokes number to the two thirds, and the obvious question is, where does that come from? Well, let's suppose I have a droplet, there's the bottom of a droplet, it's heading towards a wall in a normal direction, and I imagine there's a small sort of letterbox shape of um, width epsilon r and height epsilon squared r, and I want to know what's the size of epsilon, which is this, this, this uh, meaningful interaction between the um, droplet and, and the gas layer, which is cushioning the impact. So if I know where epsilon is, then I know the various scales to sort of non-dimensionalize um, this, this problem by. So I tend to write epsilon, other authors will tend to write Stokes number to the one-third or Stokes number to the minus one-third, depending on how you define your Stokes number. Um, but I prefer expanding things into the epsilon rather than the Stokes number to the one-third. Right. So how big is the how big is epsilon in this case? So we have a droplet of radius r heading towards a wall with speed um, u, and we're imagining at the time <coughs> the interaction starts taking place, then the separation between the wall and the droplet is epsilon squared r. That gives me time scale. So how long does it take my droplet to cross a vertical height of epsilon squared r, and I have a velocity, so that's a time scale. And in order to maintain um, anything else in the problem, the next biggest term in the droplet is the pressure scale, so that will define the pressure scale um, I need to achieve in, in the droplet in order to maintain, maintain um, that leading order. And then providing epsilon and the Reynolds numbers are small or large respectively, then I end up with essentially the linearized Euler equations um, in the um, droplet. Now, I want to couple this to the gas film, and therefore I have to achieve an equivalent size magnitude pressure. Um, in the gas film, except now my gas film has um, a small aspect ratio. I'm in mean, a sort of lubrication um, territory here. And what I want to do um, in order to balance this, I have to think in order to conserve mass, um, my downward speed of my droplet is going to be U, but in order to obviously conserve mass in this small aspect ratio film, my characteristic horizontal um, gas velocity it has to be an order of size or larger, otherwise I'm going to not conserve mass um, down here. I'm going to deal purely in this talk with um, non-compressible um, gas cushioning. You can do compressible gas cushioning if your gas pressure scale 
um, is comparable to your ambient gas pressure, but that just complicates things. And I've done stuff on that, but, and I'll, I can point to some references if you're interested um, in, in, in that um, later on. So putting those scales in, what you want to do is find the balance between the red terms, which is your balance in, your, in, in the horizontal momentum equation. Essentially, the rotation just drops out of, of here. And balancing those two terms with the scales I've described already, you get this balance. And writing this in terms of epsilon, you define epsilon to be the Stokes number to the power um, one third. Or if you define Stokes number the other way up, Stokes number to the minus one third, depending on your um, exact definition of, of Stokes number. So that appeared, I think, in a couple of talks, um, maybe last week. But it's good to see, I think, where a good idea to where the super's actually come from. Right, so we have done some um, validation of this, these scaling laws with, with, with various collaborators. Here are some uh, results for um, what we're doing here. Um, there was a round of body, it was dropping on water, and you see the dark region where we have contact, and of course you can measure the initial radius of the contact, and that will uh, depend, that will look like epsilon times r. Given an epsilon, you can pull out a pre-factor from the experiments and numerics and compare the two and we got good agreement for this kind of thing. So there's good um, validation for solid bodies here, and Siggy Shiraz and other, other people have then subsequently done it um, for droplets. The trick with droplets, you have to be careful about your length scale, it's the length scale at the bottom of the droplet at the point it enters the um, cushioning regime, because obviously droplets can oscillate in free fall. So you have to be very careful about how you actually determine the, the, the characteristic R for that particular problem. So in the experiment, you go to uh, in those terms, yeah. so they were, they were pushing it, um, it was done over and colleagues over in Novice first. They were dropping. Um, Which is different than the dropping back. Yeah. <laughs> the, the body there is much larger than that, so essentially you achieve the same Reynolds number by having a larger and slower body impact. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Right, so modeling approaches. Most important, like a droplet heading towards the wall in the normal direction. There are various things you can do, and this is set, set what I'm doing in the context of what other people have done previously. Um, various things you can do. You can obviously measure the domain, look for some interface capturing thing, basilisk, VOF methods, Joey, so open the phone, all of these things will do a, a good job in, in those kind of problems. The other thing you can do is also sort of map, mesh the whole um, boundary of the droplet and do a sort of global boundary element method and visit your droplet and then sort of gas lubrication um, in the small region at the bottom. And then what I'm going to talk about primarily today, I'm just going to look at a local model where I'm meshing the bottom of the droplet and assuming the droplet has appropriate um, far field boundary conditions. And again, coupling that to um, a viscous um, lubrication um, region. All of these approaches are valid. They all have their uses in various different cases. Um, bottom left hand, what I'm going to be talking about, has advantages in it, probably gives you the highest fidelity um, in resolutions in, in very close to the um, contact site because you're only measuring a small part of the domain and you can get quite high um, spatial resolutions for numerically not stupidly expensive calculations um, at that point. And if that's what you're interested in, um, that's a good thing to go at. So there's a sort of leading order problem out of a droplet which gets linearized down into a half space um, and acceleration uh, lubrication in the, in the gas film and then various um, boundary conditions. To leading order, um, the, there is actually no slip on the gas on the droplet interface. It's a higher order correction which gives you a sort of correct um, component to the um, gas flow on, on, on that boundary. And then you solve those equations, lubrication one drops out to sort of Reynolds squeeze film type equation and your potential flow in the gas in the half space can give you something that looks like a Hilbert transform in relation to acceleration and the pressure gradient. And I say, this, this goes back to what Papamos Frank, Frank was doing um, in his original paper. But there are sort of typical um, solutions. I should just say here, I'm going to solve stuff in two dimensions. I'll talk a bit about extensions and symmetry and 3D at the end. Obviously, droplet impacts are not noticeably two dimensional, but it's a good starting point. And if you're interested in behavior sort of out at some horizontal distance out here, then the radial solution of the symmetric problem is pretty close to the sort of two-dimensional um, behavior here. So let me talk you through this plot in a bit of detail because we'll see quite a few things um, that look like this as we go on. So at the top we have the three surfaces and they're coming in 
um, from the top. Now, as they come in, there's a gas pressure buildup at the bottom, and that will decelerate um, the droplet. The dash flat line is the time t equals zero, so that would be the instant the droplet would hit the surface in the absence of gas cushioning. So the gas cushioning then delays um, the uh, droplet, and you have a sort of bifurcation, and you start trapping uh, a volume of um, gas, which then goes on to form um, the bubble, and the characteristic pressures are highest where the separation between the um, free surface and the solid wall um, Underneath our, our minimum. And then in this case, we get a touchdown at about uh, T equals um, 5. So that's a bit sensitive to the numerics, but you can push this, oops, mind what that is. Um, you can push it as far as you go by adaptive time stepping um, and various um, techniques um, like, like that. So the key problem with this model, and where this theory has slightly broken down, is obviously you've got a big problem when H does tend to zero because. Well, lubrication at that point is parabolically generates as your, um, your diffusion coefficient for H cubed is um, zero. So if H gets to zero, you've got a problem in terms of you can't compute solutions um, for, for later times um, <coughs> than that. That's a situation in the absence of surface tension. If you add surface tension, um, modify the normal stress balance, um, sigma here is essentially a the reciprocal level we introduce the favor number um, depending on again the impact um, parameters. But in this case you can find the sort of stating behavior which is reported in the firm by Mandre and co-authors um, and other people. Uh, since then where you have a sort of minimum separation and it skates along on a cushion of air and you smooth out um, the corresponding pressure profiles um, in, in, in the case um, where so if you've got enough so if you finish on here you can actually um, avoid a touch turn there. Typically, you have to be doing much slower than the sort of impact speeds um, I'm primarily interested in here. I want to talk higher impact speeds where touch down impact is inevitable, but just to put it in context, at lower speeds, you can get into these regimes where um, you don't actually have uh, a touch down um, at all. What's next? Right, so. That's a fairly idealized situation of a completely flat plate and idealized two-dimensional um, droplet. But reality is obviously not that tidy. What happens in practice is there will be some measure, and I apologize for my dodgy cartoon drawings at this point, there's a few of these coming on, but there's, um, there will be some roughness, some asperities actually on the surface um, of, of your, 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 your body. Um, so what people do, they can do experiments that they cleave minor surfaces then they get their asperities down to tens of nanometers. Or the other thing you can do is have a droplet impact hitting a viscous fluid, and that, and that will smooth off your surface, um, again, to avoid um, asperities and, and other roughness on, on, on the surface. But, okay, I've exaggerated the roughness there, but you can see if the droplet comes in, one of two things can happen. It will either skate over the top, as in the previous case with, with the surface tension, or it will descend to a level where it actually starts to interact with um, whatever roughness is actually going on um, in um, that surface. So it all depends on how you prepare your surfaces here. It's quite sensitive to um, what you actually um, do. Right. So it's essentially balanced. There are other things in play, but ultimately, really probably, we had conversations with, with Jose um, last week about this, but. Um, there's a balance here between the, the, the size of the roughness, the height of the roughness, and how important surface tension is. If surface tension is high, big enough, then you'll keep your droplet off the surface. Um, but obviously, if your roughness gets large enough, then no amount of surface tension will keep your droplet um, away um, from, from impact. So that's a kind of complicated, horrible situation you end up with in practice. What we're going to do to clean this up and actually make some progress in the post-impact problem is kind of assume that well, the key idea here is that rather than having the roughness, we're going to let the surface tension get very small, but be non-zero, and then look at solutions with surface tension, and we'll see what that does in the case where we have very, very small gas layers, which in practice are not going to exist because they are so thin, the, the roughness is going to actually um, rupture that um, gas layer under um, the droplet. But we want to see what happens as we assume I have a perfect smooth surface, 
fairly small level of surface tension, and then let the calculation run, so let, let, let these things run, and see actually what happens as um, I can turn down that surface tension and get closer and closer to the case um, where I have no surface tension. But the conclusion of a small amount of surface tension lets me actually continue those calculations actually beyond the point where they would otherwise have actually stopped. What is the surface tension? <coughs> is it driving the flow into the, into the bit that's closest to the wall to sort of push it away? It, so, so if I go back to, uh, where was it? Hang on. So if you look at this picture, right at the points is that surface tension. If uh, what happened ultimately is like a roundy corner, roundy corner, and ultimately it tries to form a cusp at the point, it touches down. And where it tries to form a cusp, the curvature becomes unbounded, and that will locally sort of pull it away from the. We were discussing this the other day, but it will try and lift it off the surface. So as your surface tension increases, there's a balance between how close you can get to that cusp, and um, if you can't form that cusp, it's never going to actually rupture through through that gas layer. There's some debates about you know, the, the, um, the details of, of that one, what effects are important. Um, but ultimately, surface tension will um, keep the surface from forming sharp corners and smooth it out. And you get, as I said, the, the, well, that's a quite extreme example, but it will pull away um, the, the corners away from, from the surface in that case. Right. So, so what we're going to do. So we're going to assume that I can continue these calculations um, into the post-impact phase. Generally, as I say, it's kind of embarrassing. We stop these calculations um, historically at the point of a touchdown. We say, well, one of two things either happens. We either say um, the gap gets very, very small, and therefore we know that when the gap gets very, very small, this gas film is going to rupture. And that's actually true. It will rupture. But actually, that doesn't stop you running the calculations beyond that point. Um, what we'll get, we'll see in a second. The other thing, of course, you have to be very careful about um, in this regime um, instability. But if you be very careful with the numerics, you can actually get beyond um, these, these points. So that's what we will do. We will run these calculations a bit longer. And then this is what we can get um, for the sort of post-impact um, behavior. So this is kind of as before. The uh, blue lines are um, T uh, negative. Dotted lines T equals zero. Then we move down to uh, this point here. What I've done, I've said a threshold height here, which I'm going to say corresponds to the height of the roughness. And that's the dotted line that's somewhere, just you might see it, the back little dotted line and the bottom of here. And when it's gone through that dotted line, that's at the height of the roughness. At that point, I'm better off, it will rupture, it will um, then touch the surface. But under this assumption that I have a perfect smooth surface, even though I'm below this height of what we call the roughness. I could run this calculation, and actually, what's if I zoomed in here, what we'll see is the droplet lower surface spreading over essentially a precursor layer of gas separating the droplets from the um, impact um, with, with, with the point. So here, it looks like it's touched down. It's touched down at some um, predefined level that I've chosen for the height of the roughness. It hasn't at any point actually hit the solid surface, so I have a continuous um, free surface, H is non-zero everywhere, and that means I can still solve my lubrication equation because H has never gone to zero. I've not got this problem where H is um, parabolic degenerate um, in that case. And of course, what we're seeing here is the pressure build up. We hit a maximum and then it comes back down um, the, the other side. So that's the basic um, picture um, to take home from this. So as an aside, before I go on any further, there are class of problems where we do model essentially what we're looking at here is a rupture of a fin film. And there's a class of problems where we have a fin film and we look at how they rupture and how we go about doing it. In that particular case, we have a liquid in this case, so I've swapped the fluids over. Here I have a liquid layer with an ambient non existent gas above rather than a droplet descending down. But also, I have a sort of lubrication equation. The simplest thing I can do if I want to say, um, okay, there's a lubrication equation, <coughs> normal stress balance. I've got some disjoining pressure, I've got some surface tension um, in this particular problem. That's essentially the, 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 the cusp I would form for the, the point of impact. What I would actually like to do is expand it to a sort of the rupture phase um, out here 
And I can do that by adding a disjoining pressure, something like this, and having a precursor film, which my, my um, layer height is then prevented from going beneath that. And I can propagate the um, calculations beyond the point which it otherwise would have um, touched down. So that's the sort of theory. If I ran this type of calculation, you get pictures that look like this. I have some initial disturbance on the free surface. It will propagate down to um, the precursor film height down here. And then it's spread over that precursor film height, rather than going right down to H is zero. And I should say that's the solution of that simple um, problem. Um, you can, as I say, you can calculate the free surface um, evolution, um, excuse me, in that case. Right, so we have a post-impact theory, we have some results. How does that compare to um, Wagner theory? So, with slight, slight trepidation about talking about Wagner theory in the UEA seminar, um, what you get is a mixed boundary value problem for, in this case, I've written it out for the uh, velocity potential, but essentially, you linearize your droplets onto a half space and you have a wetted region um, between two contact lines and you have properties there and you have them properties outside that in the um, far field as it matches onto the um, far field surface. That's what's called the outer problem, I'm not going to get into the details of this. We have multiple experts in the room, so I'm not going to get too involved in, in, in the details. But then you can see the uh, corresponding free surface shapes at the top and the corresponding pressure profiles um, at the bottom. So um, the Wagner theory here probably does touch the free surface. You can see, we can't see the gap, there's a, the back, there's a very small gap um, down here um, in this region. And of course, um, because there's no gas cushion or surface tension in the Wagner theory, the droplet will touch down at t equals zero, so that's our contact point in the middle of here. But as it spreads beyond um, this touchdown out here, these profiles are aligned at the same time, but you can see um, how the spreading moves along um, in this direction. And below that, we can see um, the uh, pressures and the corresponding um, the pressures um, here. So um, the pressure UK for Wagner is obviously much more dramatic than the pressure UK was spotting here. But we'll probably still no regime for the um, sort of post impact behavior for the gas cushioning. We well, haven't quite run it out far enough, so I want to go away at Aberdeen and run these calculations for a bit longer and see if we pick up the um, same pressure decay we get from Wagner when I run for, for, for longer um, time. I have slightly cheated here, I have to have one um, parameter to, to play with. Um, I've picked a value of surface tension for the pre impact case, but the Wagner pressure here I've plotted is so, the so called composite Wagner pressure. And there's a small parameter floating around in there, which I picked so that the amplitude of the pressure is of the same height on the um, last two profiles. So what I've done, I've picked this up so that that height there matches that height there, but it works to value the small parameter inherent in the um, asymptotic expansion for, for Wagner theory. So as I change increased surface tension, what will happen is Pressures will all decrease as I need to increase the value of that asymptotic parameter in Wagner. Again, um, the pressures will uh, decrease. So, have a close look at the pressures. I've plotted um, the final pressure profiles and actually the uh, two from the end pressure profiles here. The dotted profiles are the Wagner, and the solid lines come from the, the post-impact um, modeling. You can see that the post-impact modeling ones are slightly further out than the Wagner one. I think that's due to a, sort of a mass conservation argument, um, which causes the droplet to spread a little bit more because of the volume trapped underneath the droplet here. And of course, the, the far field behavior um, is the same in these two cases. So, in order to sort of account for the factors and avoid the definition of the droplet here, it spreads the contact line and it's slightly further up um, in um, these, these, these cases. So, actually, this is done just with um, surface tension and um, nothing else. So, I've not included in these pictures anything due to um, gas kinematics, uh, kinematic effects, which are essential. <coughs> Um, I've not included anything in here about um, disjoining pressures. 
There's nothing about compressibility in here. So all of those things probably need including at some point, but um, that takes us further and further away from Wagner. So the first easy comparison to make is with, with the straight up Wagner theory where we have um, all those simplifications and a few more uh, built into um, the, the, the theory. So a few more comparisons. Picture on the left is this, the evolution of the load. The dotted line is the 2 pi behavior you expect for the integral of the load after the post-impact at t equals zero. So we're, we're picking that up. <coughs> uh, the middle plot, um, the, the various colors here match the colors previously. So the, t, the blue is the, um, before t equals zero. The red is after t equals zero before we've reached its arbitrary height. And the purple is what we're calling post-impact. Um, so once we've reached the impact phase, the volume of the bubble trapped beneath the droplet remains constant, as you um, would expect. And then the uh, comparison with the um, contact line evolution, which we're looking at the minimum height, the sort of causal position, the minimum height on, on the surface. But now, of course, we have both essentially an inner contact line, which is this thing here, and after the contact line, which is slightly in advance of the Wagner theory of the pressure plot plots um, showed. Um, and we can track the evolution of both the inner and outer contact line um, at the arbitrary height we've set um, in the uh, calculations once this height has been um, achieved. And then as I change, as I slightly increase the um, strength of surface tension, so lowest surface tension is over on the left, the highest surface tension is over on the right, and to convince you that I'm actually well below the regime where I'd expect skimming, I'm actually in the re regime where I would expect to see um, impact. Um, for that value over on the left, I get a height, a dimensional height, having done a relative scale, is epsilon squared times r um, for an air water system with that particular value of um, sigma. So I've said I have a one millimeter radius droplet, and for an impact speed of 0.97 uh, meters per second. I'd get a separation here of the order of 20 nanometers. So we're well below the heights at which we expect skimming to be hate to occur. This is well below a height that any gas from a sustainable, there is no gas film there in reality. It's just a mathematical regularization of the problem and it will compute the solution um, beyond this um, initial um, touchdown. But the calculations will run and I can show you the solutions. And the aim of this talk is to add and try to convince you that this model is useful. And in this period, the all models are uh, wrong. Some models are useful. I want to convince you that potentially there is something useful here in the ability to run these solutions beyond this initial um, touchdown phase. And even on the right hand profile, which has the highest value of this, this sigma, which amounts to the strength of surface tension, we're still only at 135 nanometers for film thickness. And the sort of skating behavior is sort of low 100, 200, 300, 400 um, nanometers and above the um, surface. So um, we have um, useful pictures there, I think, in terms of um, the, the, the profiles. Excuse me, the for me was related to the Yeah. It is not anymore. It is, yeah, it's still stepped on with the one third. But then you have the Stokes is zero point three, that's uh, hang on, what have I done here? Uh, I have to go in and check that. So I did it. Um, uh, I might have did that. I did it with last night. So I have to. It could be that the effective epsilon is very close to this. It it should be. But it is proportional to the effect. I think it could be. It depends how you define it. I think like, it should have been equal. So I have to go away and check what I've done. I might have put the wrong number in the spreadsheet last night, but I'll go away and check that. Just a comment, Peter. So I'm just impressed at how small epsilon is in these two cases you've taken. I guess that helps about the theory to be uh, so, so, yeah. Really good. Yeah, I made a bit so I, one, cl one clarification here. The Wagner theory epsilon is different to the epsilon I put on this one. The epsilon here is sorry, um, by way of clarification, the epsilon here is the epsilon I had from the first part of the talk where I had um, the, the cushion of various sizes of this this, this gas box, this metal box. And it should be a different parameter. I should put a different letter in for the epsilon attached to um, Wagner theory. Um, it should be the case that epsilon is exactly Stokes number of the one third, and if it's not that, then I've marked it and it's copied a bit of value across. So I apologize. Sorry? I need to tell you about this. Because briefly, it's just like the. 
and like my life, I don't know why I've got my check, but I've done that. Um, but anyway, um, so I say that has surface tension in there that doesn't have anything other than surface tension. Um, so, um, as I say, in terms of weaknesses of this, I get a um, good agreement with, with, with um, Wagner theory, at least I claim it's a good agreement, as, and how you which, which, um, take that as with a pinch of salt, perhaps. But again, what we've got here is something to bridge this transition between pre impact behavior and the um, post impact behavior. The weaknesses are essentially all those things I have chucked out in order to get this rather well, simplified model in that I haven't included. Um, gas kinematic effects. I haven't included um, disjoining pressure. I'll show you how to put that back in on the watch too many pictures for that in a, in a minute. Um, whoops, what will I do there? And yeah, I still don't know exactly what's doing on a touchdown. I've regularized the problem for very small values of H. I haven't actually got the behavior at the touchdown um, point. So I don't actually know what's doing on. Um, uh, down there. So, if I wanted to include a disjointing pressure, I can just add in a contribution um, which has an attractive and um, impulsive term into um, my normal stress balance. And the best way to actually solve this numerically, um, there's our basic um, model. What we can do is actually define what we've called a, a, a coupling pressure. So, we want to put, for, for various numerical reasons, we want to put the term corresponding to surface tension into the Hilbert transform because we can deal with that via Fourier transform, it's nice and smooth. And we put the term due to disjoining pressures into the lubrication equation um, because that's where it's handled um, best there. So uh, we can define a, um, so we'll call it a coupling pressure, muck about with the um, normal stress balance, and we end up with a slightly modified pair of equations in terms of this coupling pressure, P. And, and the film height, where essentially the only difference to the case you get for surface tension is the addition of this, this additional term here, which is a bit of a mess, but it's fairly benign in terms of um, its behavior and actually it's regularizing um, your um, solutions. I'm not actually going to show you um, pictures um, for that, but what I will show you some um, cases um, well, I want to try and add a bit of roughness. This is probably somewhat ill-advised in the context of the lubrication theory, um, but let's see what we can and can't do um, in terms of assuming I have some rather than the front surface, I can have some prescribed height of um, my um, lubrication layer, and I've just put some um, sinusoidal um, profiles in as, as roughness. This will obviously break down at a certain point because I'm going, I'm officially governed by the lubrication theory here says so a maximum rating to which I can legitimately have in my um, free surface. But you can do this with more realistic um, shapes as well and see where you have gas entrainment. Again, this is a two dimensional calculation, so a little bit of work is required to interpret what this means in terms of a three dimensional thing. Obviously, there's no actually symmetric analog to sort of a, a, an array of regular city block type um, roughness you might find on a hydrophobic surface. So, um, 2D is a good starting point. I'll say a bit about 3D um, later on um, in, 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 in the talk. Um, wage entry, again, I've talked, I think I mentioned liquid solid impact. I want to spend my entire time talking about droplets, so um, you can do very similar things with, with a wage entry. I've only plotted the right hand half of the wedge to clarity here, but you can see the free surface. Um, you have effect uh, regions of capillary waves um, just to the right of the various contact points, and there's a, a volume of gas trapped um, in, in, inside uh, beneath the um, wedge. It always depends on how sharp the wedge is. If the wedge gets too sharp, then it will rupture straight through the um, gas film. So there's a balance between uh, the, the gradient of the wedge and um, whereabouts exactly um, the, the, the gas. I should have said at the outset that I've, on all of these plots, I'm essentially vertically stretching the, the vertical axis much more than I'm stretching the horizontal axis to uh, exaggerate all these effects. So um, you can bear that in mind when actually looking at um, these, these plots. So as well as liquids hitting solids, I want to spend a bit of time talking about liquids hitting um, liquids. So this is droplet impacts with um, deep water, and again, 
Um, and this time we have two free surfaces, H plus for the droplet, and H minus, which is the surface of the um, liquid layer. And you can see the um, capillary waves um, that are disappearing off into the droplet far field here. We can see the capillary wave decaying. These may not look well resolved, but just if you actually zoom in there, you will see nicely resolved um, capillary waves. We have a pressure maximum, and then the pressure is coming down, as again you would expect by a, a comparison with frequent experiments as well as um, Wagner. If you wondered about the capillary waves, I would interpret this as what you get a sort of capillary retraction. Um, I start with a surface. Um, looks something like this, just after impact and tuck and joining, and then it pulls back, it retracts, I start forming capillary waves on the upper and lower free surface, um, like that. Um, obviously, for the they need question where the jet sits in this story, there's some more work to be done to evaluate um, what happens to the jet when we have the um, capillary um, effects turned on um, in this situation. So, uh, more work um, to be done um, there. Um, again, a comparison um, with, with, with Wagner theory. Um, so the left is the, the two free surfaces, and um, the middle plot here, I've got the difference. It's actually that brings you back to the pictures you're familiar with from the droplets. So um, the, what you get if you take a droplet hitting a um, liquid layer, and you plot the separation between the two droplet heights, you actually get the same set of equations you get for a droplet hitting a solid plate, and that's why you get a profile in the middle here, which is looks rather like the case you get for a droplet hitting a, a, a solid wall. And then over on the right, there's the um, pressure profiles. Uh, the Wagner pressure here doesn't decay because I've only actually plotted the outer solution rather than the composite solution um, in this case. But the pressure maxima are again in a, in a very comparable location at the same time because the contact line is moving out from the center at roughly the same speed as you predict via um, Wagner um, theory. So as the surface tension increases, you get um, longer wavelength and um, capillary waves on both the top and bottom um, three surfaces. As I said before, in this case, it's a bit hard to think about what is, I, I've preset this distance, well, the distance at which I've said touchdown is going to occur. It's less clear to me what that distance should be in the case of a liquid-liquid impact because there's no asperities on the um, surface anymore. So we have a genuine liquid-liquid problem. You probably still have some dust or something sitting on your surfaces which will ultimately um, lead to rupture. But it's a little bit less clear how you measure how big those are in a liquid-liquid system um, than you would do in a, a, a liquid-solid um, um, system. And just because you can do this, um, there's a couple of cases where I've got um, a high value of surface tension on one surface and a low value on the other. And the interesting thing here is actually for these two cases, you get identical pressure distributions um, for these two cases. So um, one on the left, I have a lower surface tension over here, so I have a shorter wavelength, longer wavelength over here. The wavelength um, regime would have swapped over on here, but two pressure profiles for two cases are pretty much indistinguishable um, out of those, 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 those two problems. Um, what do we do with finite depth liquid layers rather than deep liquid layers? Well, we have to be a bit clever and do something with the integration. But we form a sort of hamburger set up like this. And for an appropriate height of uh, an impenetrable layer depth, we build an image system. We have an image layer and an image droplet, and then we integrate a contour um, around both the layer and the layer image, and also a third contour around the um, droplet image, and then it gives us essentially three integral equations um, we can uh, play with here. So obviously the droplet doesn't, it's just the same equation as before. Um, I've written it in terms of Fourier convolutions to save a bit of space here, um, but you can essentially and produce this by um, coached into a formula and um, mucking about with the um, various um, contributions. <coughs> Actually, to solve these things, you're better off recognizing these things as Fourier convolutions, and then you can actually quite conveniently express these things um, in a Fourier transform coordinates. Um, so capital H is the Fourier transform version of the free surface, so calculate the pressure, calculate the Fourier transform, you find the Fourier transformed free surface, Take the inverse Fourier transform to get back to 
your local position in real space, and of course you can iterate this around to get rid of um, your, your um, nonlinearities and lubrication um, equation. So there are some pictures of various layer depths. The one on the left has the deep water, so that has the most penetration into the liquid. And then as we lower the layer depth, we're moving over towards the right. Uh, two things we note, the penetration gets less and less because it's harder to deform the lower surface when there's a, uh, a solid body underneath it. And the, the pressure's increased because, again, it's, it's harder to deform the, the lower surface when there's something underneath it. So um, uh, what we see there, the profiles, is, is, is the is L gets smaller um, and um, smaller. So I've talked solely on um, two dimensions. Uh, I will just explain what the equations extend to three dimensions, that symmetry in 3D, and then I'll show you one um, solution in three dimensions um, just to finish. So you can obviously write down the very same formula with an symmetry. Um, the transformed um, formula is here. Um, so sorry, the transformed integral equation going the free surface is there. Um, H, capital H now is a zero for order Hankel transform, which is a bit of a um, fiddly thing to deal with, but it has the same structure in terms of the equation we had before. You do um, Green's function now is obviously rather than um, contour um, integration. And the corresponding lubrication equation and um, the um, transformed um, liquid layer equation um, is here rather in, 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 in three dimensions now, where capital letters in the in three dimensional case are two dimensional um, Fourier transforms. But you can see a sort of structure, if you remember what the, the, the 1D equation was, um, these various cases of sort of hierarchy of problems um, here, which are very similar in terms of the equations um, you would solve um, as you would expect. <coughs> so, just to finish off, and um, a solution probably for Sasha. Sasha has a famous um, solution of Wagner theory for an um, elliptical paraboloid. So what we've done here is looked at the gas cushioning of um, the elliptic paraboloid. The color map now is essentially the height separation between um, what I'm plotting here is one quadrant of the elliptical paraboloid. Um, I think the semi-minor axis is um, in that direction. The semi-major axis is that way. So I'm plotting one quadrant looking down from the inside of the um, electrical paraboloid. I should have replotted these. Um, these are fairly new, so I need a few things to check here. But as the, the body comes in, it obviously the free surface deforms out of the way, um, like so. It starts to build up on the side. It may not be very clear, so that's got close to the impact. So I've mapped, I've, I've, I've put the color map here. So you probably can't see it, but there's a darker grey region um, here, which is where we're inside this actually precursor um, film on the height of the wires. And that profile essentially continues. So touchdown is going to occur and the semi-minor axis first, and then it will spread around the sort of crescent um, until it goes around to which is the semi-major axis, closing um, the pocket of gas um, underneath. Hang on. Back to the previous page. So, it hasn't quite reached closure, but you, you probably hard to see the back. But the photo of the here, there's a line along here and up here. So, that's the region on the um, surface of the paraboloid where the um, separation is inside this precursor um, layer height that I described, which says that is the height at which touchdown is actually going to um, be happening. Uh, although, in this case, I've idealized and regularized the problem to keep the liquid surface away from the solid body, just enough to, to, to um, propagate the calculations um, beyond um, that point. So to wrap up what I've done, I've looked at some post-impact problems where I've regularized the gas cushioning to allow me to continue um, the solutions beyond the point at which um, a touchdown um, would occur. I've done quite a few comparisons with Wagner theory for various things in, 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 in droplet impact to solid plates, and there's good agreements for a range of different um, things in there. Um, some extensions to roughnesses and um, impacts with, with, with liquid layers, and I've tried to say roughly how you expand these things to um, three dimensions work on doing um, in that area. With that, um, thank you, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation. 
And if you have any questions, then I will try my best to answer them. Thank you. Not at the moment, I think that we have to have, I think. So at the moment, if they don't have the attractive and repulsive joining presses in, it will go down to whatever height is stabilized by separate tension, which may be below the height of whatever the is, is this, this arbitrary height in. But so, you put this arbitrary height in? Yeah, if, so if you put the arbitrary height in, yeah. at that point you can prescribe a repulsive and disjoining, attractive and disjoining pressures which will keep your height at that height. I haven't done that at this stage, So, so uh, well, I guess the question I'm asking is, in the formulation that you have, yeah. have you investigated variations of that? Uh, no, I mean, it doesn't make any difference because it, it's not essentially an arbitrary height. Uh, it will, the, the only way to kick off by the point where it gets down to sort of the minimum separation value. And that minimum separation value is kind of independent of whatever height I've chosen as my height. I have to say, I have to put in an attractive and important disjoining pressure and set the precursor dome height to be the appropriate height. But then, then you could absolutely get that point. But this way you say that's not. So there are, for instance, there are two separate things. The arbitrary height that you mentioned and the minimum separation. Yeah. Those two separate things. And then how do you specify the minimum separation? So I, I don't set it. Um, the minimum distance between, let's say, the surface and the wall, yeah. that's determined by whatever value you set for tension on the uh, So what I'm saying is uh, there is a height of the roughness. Yeah. If my free surface has gone below the height that I know the roughness is actually at, then it's going to have hit something. Yeah, sure. um, but uh, I 
I, I, I don't know what, when we're talking in a way though with, with, with Jose and various people about what this minimum height actually has to be. We're a bit away from the skating regime here, but the model you predict for whatever the mineral height is skating ought to be at least a good starting point, whatever the mineral height is um, in, in, in this regime. Is it right that uh, there are no contact at all with the equipment fully? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So this is the, remind me, uh, regularization. Yes, yeah, I, I quite like realize the things that, yeah. yeah, like uh, for a uh, singular integral equation, you introduce small parameter, salt is this parameter, and without considering limit, just say, yeah, this is my uh, smooth solution. Yeah. And, uh, the, uh, do you solve, uh, uh, the gas motion equation in that same uh, layer, in the critical, I'm uh, not critical, but the limiting thickness. Are you solving? Yes, it's solved everywhere. So it's solved. Okay. So I mean, there's, okay. there's, there's very little flow at that point. Okay. separation is, is, is a little question, so it's not flow. Okay. Um, so, well, well uh, for, for pure squeeze film, because we have specified no slip on the wall and the free surface, which is correctly in order, yeah. Where your pressure takes a maximum, there is no flow across that point because the flow is away from that point in both directions. Well, your, your pressure maximum is, is moving as well. So, in the frame of the reference where your pressure maximum is shifting, you have to be careful about what you mean. But locally, pressure maximum, when you solve the lubrication equations, you have a flux away from that point in, in, in small flux when your H gets very small. Okay. So, in this layer, uh, there is a big, uh, pressure is almost constant along the but at the end, uh, it's a, a maximum, is it right? Or how is this distributed? Uh, I'm going to let me put a picture of this. It's gone, it's gone to sleep mode. But let's go back to, I should have said actually, yes, it's a good point. Um, if I pull up, let's say, that picture here. Yeah, so the pressure maximum is located at the outer contact line. So there's the outer contact line. There's the inner contact line somewhere here. Yeah. You can pressure your case, it's pretty flat away from um, maximum um, profile here, but it is decaying like what it does in the middle here. There's actually not a lot of flow to the right of the, sorry, to the left of in the drop in the bubble in here, and the, actually the bubble volume remains constant because there's no gaps really getting in and quite out at that point. And there'll be very little flow because the, the, the pipe here is very, very small compared to everywhere else. Um, the bubble volume is. is yeah, the pressure maximum is exactly at the outer contact line, which will still give you your jet partner. There's no corresponding high pressure on the inner contact line, which is good because obviously you don't want to see a jet into the ball because it doesn't exist. So you wouldn't expect to see um, one of them. The kind of, kind of criminal for this approach is fine, but criminal is that there are no uh, uh, jets. Yeah. Which are visible, so the, in some sense the uh, physics is uh, uh, not uh, in this uh, uh, module, right? Yeah, so, so one of the things you, you can do, what you think about doing, is taking the salt bar there in a solution yeah. and then matching it onto this spot in the area and compute it out of solution. Yeah. And because at a certain point, the capillary, you have a pressure balance, right? There, there's a, there's a, what I call it here is the gas pressure. And in Wagner, your liquid pressure and gas, well, your liquid pressure is what hits the wall. With this gas cushioning, I'm partitioning some of the pressure into the capillary pressure, and then some of it goes into the, the gas pressure as well. So you might imagine that there is less um, flow going into the jet because the pressure in the liquid is, is, is lower, but some of it is accounted for um, by the capillary terms. Um, so you, you might imagine, and I think if it's not much by Jose and his group, the the droplet, the jet doesn't fall immediately. Uh -huh. So you have a small region where it spreads and then the jet shoots out at a later time. Um, so that's possibly, obviously, that there's a maximum pressure here. You can know if the jet formation occurs around the point of the maximum pressure um, or not. So obviously, part the theory, the pressure goes up and up and up, that's t equals zero. So you have a jet instantaneously. Um, this will give a reason why you wouldn't have a jet instantaneously. Because the pressure builds up, hasn't reached that maximum height at that point. And the question you have for whatever maximum pressure you're achieving here is that big enough to shoot off the jet at that particular time. So, yes, there's absolutely one. The jet needs to work um, 
But I think this would be good to actually do the work to actually match it onto the 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 you know, in case. Uh, 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 I, I'm not, I don't remember a kind of uh, uh, extensive uh, uh, comparison in numbers between, uh, what's, uh, for example, for wage, uh, you know, the force acting in Wagner theory or uh, in uh, COD. And uh, uh, in your model, so you can compare uh, with that. But potentially, uh, also, the, you can always kind of tune your <laughs> by changing sickness and the surface tension. Yes. You are not there. Yeah. And <laughs> so I, yeah, I, have two I have cheated, yes, I agree, there's a ground to cheat, I have a good one, there's still a second year first practice. Um, I think the count is the pressure decay maybe we want more of this, so this may not run it for long enough. Um, so more work to be done, absolutely, um, since I say it's all. Yeah. Um, fairly early days of this stuff at this stage. Um, yeah, I, I got, what I want to claim here is that all models are wrong, this might be useful. Since also the, by using uh, your the, the approach, kind of you are uh, arising the boundaries, arising that contact line, right? So the, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, that what uh, makes the problem complicated. Right? And uh, this is why you can solve complicated problems, uh, not uh, the, the, for any shape. Actually, uh, it would be good to take kind of a strange shape of uh, say dimensional definitely uh, like pyramid for example right yes. and uh, yeah. to solve it uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe somebody did experience with pyramid and they could be compared I right. think yeah but uh, definitely no and it, nobody did it uh, by what I see it because it's too complicated yeah. I see that someone's doing pyramid recently so yes with gas questioning uh, so, in there okay so I uh, will maybe have a look at that again okay. uh, yeah, but oh, okay, one well, thing you have to say you can't pick up, you know, lubrication theory, really, so you can't pick an arbitrary shape of sh sharp corners and vertical sides, things like that. But beyond that, that's much less prescriptive than the sort of shape you can solve for your, your, your bug. So you're, you're potentially in slightly you're not complete true choices here, um, but you know what? A bit more choice than you have in the bug. Okay, I think we should come to a close. So, 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 so.